Hello and welcome to Legislative Report. I'm State Representative Mark Gillen of the 128th District in Berks and Lancaster Counties. As a history buff, I'm excited about today's program. The Pennsylvania House archives exist to preserve the history and records of the House. The archives consist of committee records, House journals, video interviews with retired members, personal collections of memorabilia, and many other items. Joining me today to tell us about the collection is Jen Ott, research analyst with the PA House Archives. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, joining me here. I am excited about this as a history buff. We're excited and to be the, part of it. And the fact that you brought some of the archival pieces, you've given us some information uh, already, which we're going to go on air with, about how not to preserve and to collect. And I'm interested in this, especially because I started a museum in Berks County, the Berks Military History Museum. So um, hopefully we're going to learn to avoid some mistakes that others have made in the past. But let's learn a little bit more about Jen. How uh, were you raised, educated, and how did you end up in the Capitol? I am from um, Shippensburg, Pennsylvania. I went to school there and I attended college at Shippensburg University. I originally went to school to be a teacher and I taught for a few years, but I really wanted to be more involved in actual history. And so I went back to graduate school and have been in the archives and museum field ever since. Um, about three years ago, I got this job here with the House Archives and it has been an very exciting position. It's different every day. The people we get to interact with and the collection is very interesting and is a very important way to preserve Pennsylvania's history. All right. I thought maybe I'd ask this question at the end, but I'm going to interject it now lest uh, it slip my mind. All right. I'm sitting here as an elected official, as, as a member. Um, I didn't realize that I would be part of the uh, archives uh, here at the House of Representatives. Um, if somebody is a sitting member, do they ever say, hey, do an interview with me and put it as part of the archives? Or do they wait till the end of the term? Do you approach them? How does that all work? As far as working with sitting members, we tend to only be there for them. Um, Occasionally, we have members who are very interested in history, want to know more about um, the Capitol or mm -hmm. about um, different people who represented their district before them, and we can help them in that way. It's usually when members are coming to the end of their term that we start getting in contact with them, asking them to sit down with us for an oral history, asking if they have any personal papers that they would like to donate to us, and um, follow up with them in that way. Curiosity question, not that I'm pl planning on doing it, but um, how many of the members avail themselves of that to say, hey, I think I'd like to do that versus members who, for whatever reason, time constraint, lack of interest, decide not to? It varies by session. Uh, this past session, there was a large number of turnover in the House, and we did, I'd say, about 75% of the members sat down to do interviews with us. Now, sometimes you have to chase them down a little bit. Um, when people leave Harrisburg, if their district is far away, getting them to come right. back to Harrisburg can be a challenge. Um, we occasionally go to the member. Uh, we have some members that were retired long before the oral history project started and we sometimes say hey they have some interesting stories that we would like to hear and we'll go to them. I'm sure there's interesting stories and there may be some that are infamous um, and so let's exempt anybody that's more contemporary from our, our thought process here on infamous but if you go back in history um, were there infamous members troubled individuals, criminals, in fact. Uh, like I said, we'll exempt anything sure. from the contemporary. <laughs> Actually, we have a biographical project, which we have been researching members. Um, we try to find where they were from, their school, what their jobs were, any other political work outside of the house. And we are currently in the 1870s doing research on members. So we have all the members currently, all the way back to the 1870s available, on our website and you can read a little bio and contact us for even more information about them. And we do come across um, 
some scandalous stories uh, in newspaper research, uh, particularly members from small towns or small uh, counties with low populations. Any little thing they did, you know, they caught a big fish last Saturday, is in the paper. And the same goes if they were involved in any kind of ruckus or l trouble with the law. We tend to find it. So there is a history of this, and it sounds like a good sure. back to, to the very beginning. Um, do you research yourself personally? Do you go through these old newspapers you've just described? I do. Uh, I have uh, two coworkers that are also research analysts, and the three of us take uh, the large share of this biographical research when we can. And we use Ancestry.com, which is a website many people are familiar with. We also use a website called Newspapers.com that has old newspapers going back all the way to the 1700s available that you can search terms and names and we can find a lot of information on members and the website is a national website but Pennsylvania has done a great job of digitizing their papers so we are in a very lucky position that we can find a lot of information. We also have a relationship with the state archives. We can access various government records, things like death certificates are available, and whenever you have some of that basic information that is found there, we can sort of be a little bit of a detective and follow up and track things down. I have called cemeteries to find burial locations, and sometimes you can find a family member's name, and you can find a will, and you can find all of these documents to find out more about the members that have served here and create a holistic view of their life. Do you think that you have enough collateral information? You go back and you read about this member from the 1870s and his local newspaper said that he caught this giant fish and didn't have a fishing license or whatever <laughs> it happens to be. Is there, today we have a lot of collateralizing information to affirm or perhaps present a slightly different picture. Do you think, given the historical context, you know, where journalism has come from in the electronic age, do you have enough information to create parallel bodies of fact and say, yeah, I think this actually was true. He did catch this big fish and didn't have a fishing license. Or are you left, in some cases, with single source? You know, Sometimes you might have a single source if it's a very small county. If you're talking about um, different perspectives on people, though, there were publications that were Democrat and Republican even back in the day. Counties would have both kinds of newspapers in their, in their county, in their town. And so you will find campaign materials or ads for members saying, yes, he's the best, or no, he's a crook. Um, even back in the 1800s, even back to the 1700s, um, negative campaigning and both sides of that, you can find that very easily. Yeah, I've heard something about negative campaigning recently <laughs> myself. You have some campaign buttons. I do. And I, I noticed those right away because I'm, I'm interested in them. I, I actually didn't utilize them. Uh, that I can recall in the last race. So um, these are, uh, can I bend this? You can bend okay, that, sure. Okay. So these are more contemporary buttons. These uh, are. And these are, these are familiar names. Mm -hmm. How far back does your campaign button collection go? Our campaign button collection goes back to our earliest pin is from about the 1870s. Um, and they were very small. I didn't bring them today because they are a little more fragile. Um, Time has been a little harder on them, but we do have some small examples from the 1800s. But this, these pins are from a collection donated by former member rep, uh, representative Fred Noy, and he was an avid campaign memorabilia collector. And he donated his large collection to us very recently of thousands of pins and other campaign items. Extending over what period of time? Well, the early ones he would find sometimes uh, on flea markets, eBay, and so he purchased some of those very old ones himself. Oh, he did, okay. But he also collected from peers, both Republicans and Democrats, while he was in office, just because he was interested in it. And I imagine some of the older buttons have significant value and need protecting by the archives. The archives tends to not put a dollar amount on the items in our collection, but they are certainly valuable in that they are rare. And a Pennsylvania member of the House pin is not something that 
is you know going to be seen as valuable perhaps if it found its way to Colorado or something and so us being able to catch them before they are discarded or slip through the fingers because people don't realize what they are is very important. Yeah, I guess it would depend on the individual. If someone was simply a state representative and they went back to their community and their job and continued therein, but mm -hmm. um, if someone was Franklin or another notable, do I, I'm suspecting that Benjamin Franklin didn't have campaign buttons. The campaign <laughs> buttons uh, were not popular in the revolution. <laughs> Well, that's great. And so you have thousands of these mm -hmm. just as a consequence of the one member's donation. Yes. Um, is this a collection that's ongoing that you continue to build if somebody has something they'd like to donate? Um, various members, when they donate their personal papers, campaign memorabilia is something we ask if they have any of. And so within individual members' collections, we have small pieces of their campaign whatever it may be. It could be bumper stickers, frisbees, fly swatters, pencils, combs were very popular for a long time. So we sort of have some of the, what was popular of the moment going through time. Um, but the large bulk of these pins are from Mr. Noy. Now you've mentioned members donating their papers, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to try to portray a false humility here. I can't think of any papers that I would be <laughs> donating. Um, what conceivably from the average member uh, would be a value to the archives relative to papers? Well, um, we ask for research files is probably the most common form of papers. So if somebody was very passionate about a particular is issue, um, we had Representative Belfonte many years ago was the member who represented the area where Centralia was. And when the mine fire happened there, he was very involved in the work of trying to get that mine fire out, the research to figure out what could be done to stop the fire, and then eventually relocating those people who live there. And he worked with the United States congressman who also had that district and was very involved in that cause. And so we have a lot of papers that he donated that were about that correspondence, meetings, studies about that. We also had uh, Representative Clymer was a big anti-gambling. Um, <laughs> Is there a stronger word? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so when he retired, we have lots of the research he had done about the negative side to legalizing gambling in Pennsylvania. We also have various legislative, the, the trail to what when a constituent contacts a member and then that leads to legislation over a particular action, if we can find like that original correspondence like, hey, there's this problem in my district, sometimes we can have that. And these days, it might even just be the email that a member contact you know, was contacted with by a constituent. So while it's changing what a current member might donate as opposed to what members of the past have, there still will be things that you'll find when you're cleaning out your office it's just, <laughs> someday in the future. It's just percolated in my mind. You were just very catalytic there. We had a cemetery situation in our own district. Constituents had complained that they were denied access to visit the graves of loved ones or, in fact, denied burial for plots that they had purchased there hmm. um, in uh, southern Berks County. There was a lot of handwritten uh, correspondence um, and some pictures that were shared of loved ones whose graves they could no longer visit, and we were fortunate. Uh, it took several years to arrive at a legislative solution to allow reasonable access um, to that cemetery. And it's really been ongoing. Um, a lot of issues that we deal with legislatively are hard issues. Um, I've attended family reunions, unfortunately, uh, funerals and special get-togethers because I've been adopted as part of the family um, because the law allowed them to uh, access the, the graves of loved ones. How much of your work, now that cemetery is in southern Berks County, and I'm sure there's historically noteworthy cemeteries that other members have had a nexus with. How much of your work takes you outside the Capitol? We don't get outside the Capitol mm -hmm. too much. For our oral history project, we do sometimes travel to a member. Uh, while we try to catch members for our oral history project where we interview them, we sit down and talk about their career, what got them into politics, those kinds of things. While we usually try to get people when they're retiring, the Oral History Project hasn't always existed. So sometimes we'll find a member who may be in their 80s or 90s, and we're like, we want to get their story before it's too late. And we have traveled to them uh, and filmed in their home 
or wherever they're, they feel comfortable filming. So those kinds of things happen. Occasionally for large donations, we will go to members' homes and help pick up things. Or occasionally um, members won't donate in their lifetime and if they pass away, um, their children sometimes don't want all of the things that the member thought maybe they would and we will go help. So if I come up with a large <laughs> donation, you'll come out and visit, right? We would love to come visit. Okay, you. exactly. <laughs> Can you pass the uh, paper clip and, yes. and the rubber band along to me? Because I looked at this and I thought, wow, I'm bringing Jen here and uh, it looks like uh, we have Benjamin Franklin's paper clip and uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson's rubber band, but what you've brought here is a display of how not to archive. Tell me what this depicts. Well, in our, in our professional collection or even in your home collections of family papers and photographs, things like rubber bands, they deteriorate over time. I think everyone has seen an old rubber band stick to paper and when you remove it, it's going to rip the paper. Paper clips rust over time, so if you have a bunch of papers or photos clipped with a paper clip, over time it could damage and tear those items. So in the house archives, we try to remove all of those things from anything that's donated and store our papers in acid-free materials like folders and boxes. So these are things that when paper or objects are in them, you don't have to worry that the acid, which paper is naturally acidic, it's from the pulp, and if you have uh, it next to a photograph or paper, it can discolor. But when you purchase these acid-free materials, um, that won't happen. And you can get these at um, big box craft stores and things these days because it's so popular. And you see more and more average individuals availing themselves of these features? Absolutely. Interest in genealogy and genealogy websites uh, has increased people's knowledge about preserving their family's history. And the House Archives occasionally even can help with that. Just last week, we had uh, the grandson of a former member come in and say, hey, what's my grand what did my grandfather do while he was here? And wanted some copies of the things we have in our collection. We can tell them, oh, he sat here, and we can give them papers and copies and things for them to preserve on their own at home for their family's history. Um, and, you know, we had, we'll advise them to, you know, try to keep things in a way that they will be around for future generations. So if a family member comes in, you'll share the archived materials with them. Mm -hmm. um, and you say, in some cases, they take them out? Here. We'll make copies or scans for them. You'll make them? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me ask you this. All right, so I've got this acid-free material here, and I really don't know the answer to this sure. question. Okay, I'm handling, I'm passing to family members, a number of different people are handling, breathing, you know, on it. What doesn't this like? All right, so I'm assuming it likes a drier environment out of the light. Um, what do we not want to expose this to? Well, any record in general, you don't want to expose to extreme temperature differences. When things are very hot, it gets dry usually and things can get brittle, pages will crumble. Um, if you keep things in a too damp area like a basement, you'll get problems like mold and that will, you know, ruin collections. So whenever you're storing any kind of records, try to keep them at an uh, a even temperature without extremes of high or lows like attics and basements can get. You want to keep the humidity um, kind of at a constant too, where you're not having it too dry or too uh, damp. And of course, light. You want to keep things in the dark as much as you can. Uh, whenever you have a photo on the wall or papers laying out, you've all seen how the sun fades and sucks out the colors. So say you have a very nice photograph that you want to keep safe, but you also want to have it on display because it's special. What we would recommend is making a copy of the photo displaying the copy and then keeping your original maybe in some acid-free materials and, and put away so that they aren't being handled so much and that they have uh, a good chance of not being damaged. You have your own equipment, you talked about copying, or do you use a commercial vendor? Um, we, you can use a regular copier to do any of that. We can buy acid-free paper, um, which you can also find you know, through a big box store online. Acid-free paper sort of just feels a little more durable, sort of like resume paper, a little more sturdy, and it will just hold up a little better over time. 
For example, newspaper is some of the worst uh, at its longevity. Everyone has pulled an old newspaper clipping that their family has kept out and it's crumbling, it's yellowed, it's stained the pages that are next to it. In the archives, we don't keep newspaper at all. We photocopy it onto our acid tree paper and keep the copies and throw away the newspaper because the newspaper itself is not what has value, it's the content on the page that is of value to us, mostly. It sounds labor intensive. It can be. Um, we have our staff, we have an internship program, so sometimes we have interns that will help us out in doing some of the copying of the newspapers that get donated. And you have a staff plus seasonal interns mm -hmm. of how many? Um, the Archives and Records Center has eight full-time staff, um, and that's just not uh, the archives part, but there's also the records part where they do things um, like record the committee hearings and make sure that those transcripts are available online. So we do some, a little bit of some other stuff that isn't necessarily what you think of as more historic. More clerical. Yeah. More clerical work. Right. Um, and then we have anywhere from one to three interns depending on what projects we have going on. We have three right now because it was the end of session and we have all of last session's committee records um, waiting to be processed and put on our shelves and made available um, with finding aids online. Where are these shelves? Where are you located in the building? We are located on the sixth floor of the Irvis office building. We actually have only been there a few weeks. Um, we used to be in the Forum Auditorium, which is where the State Library is. That building's being renovated, so we've been moved back to the Capitol and have ma the majority of the sixth floor of Irvis, and we have uh, new shelving that can better take care of our records for posterity. I don't think I've ever been on the sixth floor of the Irvis building. I've had no reason to go up there. Now well, I know it's there. For many years, it, it once upon a time was home to the courts. The judges' offices were up there. And it sat as a furniture haven for the last several years since the courts left. <laughs> and it wasn't until our need for a new home came up that it was cleaned out and we were put up there. You've got some pictures and some other things in here, uh, examples Absolutely. of uh, mishandling or misstoring. This is from a collection that me and an intern are currently processing, and it, this member has donated newspapers, photos, memos. This is actually a draft of a newsletter he was going to send out, but it was arranged in such a way that a photo was on top of the newsletter and then a newspaper on top of that and you can see where the newspaper has bled and discolored the page made it brown and where the photo was you can see the white spot of just what this has done in not even 20 years. Now this has got <clears throat> former Senator Pecola's name on here doesn't it? Okay so is he responsible for this? <laughs> well, Jeff is a friend, by the <laughs> oh, way. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Senator Piccola was a House member before his time in the Senate, so he qualifies as somebody whose things we, we would take, and he donated um, lots of materials, lots of great photos from his work. and uh, There's a great picture of him also. The sketch, I'm not sure who was responsible for, but it's unique. Um, members still do newsletters, and we rarely see the goings-on of what goes into making their newsletter. So this is a great piece that we would love to keep, and it's just a shame it's a little bit tarnished, but it's been saved <clears throat> now, and we can uh, keep it for future generations to see. It confirms my suspicion that I should not be doing my own drawings of, <laughs> of my picture. Okay. <laughs> and then this picture over here, it's actually several pictures? It's two pictures. And what was the problem uh, in the handling these or pictures, storing of this? These pictures got wet and when the photos get wet and then dry they are basically impossible to separate and without ripping the bottom photo because it's just the thin layer of the image on top of the paper. So luckily a lot of these photos were from the House and Senate and we can um, get duplicates or Many times there were multiple copies. So these ones being a little damaged is not the end of the world for us because we can get other copies. But if you have one-of-a-kind photos and you let them get wet or even water in a frame that touches the picture, if you try to take it out after it dries, will likely not come off cleanly. Okay. So this should have been presented to you or quickly put in acid-free and not wet, obviously. Sure. 
But the nature of when you're collecting things and uh, is that you're storing it away in a way and then things sit somewhere and it can happen in a home and it can happen in this building that you know a pipe leaks and something gets wet and you might not even realize it for a day or just two and that's all it can take uh, for something to be damaged. And, and speaking of that pipe bursting, what is it about where you have the collection, how it's stored that protects against some macro incident or damage? Well, luckily being on the sixth floor, there's not too many pipes above the heads of our records. Um, but once the, uh, long ago, the archives were actually in the basement of the Capitol and a pipe did burst and a lot of records got wet. And what they had to do is pack them in a way in which they could be frozen and then dried safely. So we actually have sets of records that have that crunchy paper um, look of you know wet and then dried paper uh, because of a pipe burst and those things just happen. Freeze dried records. Mm -hmm. It's one of the uh, ways in which large floods are actually taken care of is that you freeze them and then they can be thawed sort of in their when you're ready to take right. care of them individually. Because uh, if you let them get wet for too long and just stay wet, they'll mold. And sometimes ink will bleed depending on what kind of paper and ink was used on it. And so uh, freezing is actually how we uh, deal with a big crisis of a flood. As we wind down in our final uh, moments here, is there a favorite record, archive, personality, air, or something Jen likes this, and she enjoys going back and doing more study in this particular area, this particular individual. Anything about your job that you especially delight in? Well, I like writing the newsletter. It's one of my favorite things that I've gotten to take the lead on, and it gives me a chance to do quarterly deep dives into various topics. Uh, last year, we did some work on veterans, Vietnam veterans who were in the House. It was part of a larger project the House and Senate had done to try to get Vietnam veterans uh, their benefits that they're due. Great. And it was a wonderful opportunity to learn not only more about house members that have served, but connect their service with the service of other veterans in the state, which was a wonderful experience. And then I can move on and I can write about something else the next time. And basically any part of Pennsylvania history that you want to take a look at, the legislature and the members who have served here have been part of it. And that's always fun. Well, I'll look forward to uh, adding some elements um, to, to your records and, and archives. And uh, if someone can't get to sleep at night and have insomnia, they can go through uh, my old papers. Actually, I would hope there'd be some legacy for my passion on uh, veterans' issues and uh, working uh, with the aging. And uh, certainly, maybe I'll even share some of the records of how we led up to a success story and allowing people to get to the graves Wonderful. of loved ones. I'm State Representative Mark Gillen. If you have questions about what we've discussed today, feel free to contact me at my local office or through my website. That information will be shown in a moment. Thanks for watching, and please join me next time for Legislative Report. Yeah.